Hey guys, in this video I'm going to take a more in-depth look at the Scott 6T11 tabletop projection TV that I picked up recently. I showed it briefly in an earlier video when it was still out in my car. Well, just this afternoon I managed to haul it up inside. This thing is a beast. I took out two of the main trans, uh, chassis to lighten the load, but even so, by the time I got this up two flights of stairs and into my place, my back was really starting to ache. So just to give you some idea of the scale of this, here is an RCA 630TS, which is about 100 pounds. Well, the Scott is bigger. It's both larger dimensionally and heavier. So, uh, quite a challenge to get up here. So now you can really see the extent of the cabinet damage. Apparently this was in great condition. It was stored in the basement and water leaked onto it over a long period of time. So, uh, the top is trashed. Amazingly though, inside, it's in pretty darn good shape. The chassis appear to be pristine. No corrosion, no water damage. The main body of the cabinet is also, for the most part, in good shape. This side, just a little veneer separation down here, I think. And it's awfully scuffed up too, but... Otherwise, the finish is in really good shape, which is a shame. <laughs> I, I believe them that this was in really good, uh, good shape at some point. Uh, fortunately, it got kind of hacked up here. Uh, who knows, this probably got kicked around in the basement for years and stuff, smashed into it, so... I suppose it'll get refinished at some point. But I definitely want to do what I can to preserve the f this area because it's got the original labels on it. So focus control, brightness control... Well, let me grab some more light, see if I can the situation. Alright, I think that's better. Alright, so focus control, brightness control, there's the channel indicator. That's interesting, I hadn't noticed that before. This is a metal screw-on plate, but underneath it I can see numbers behind there. And they're going counterclockwise, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I'll pop that off and see what's on there. There's Scott logo. Volume control, contrast control. Now this area, this rectangle in here, is in pretty good shape. As is this area here. But it's kind of scuffed up around in here. Uh, and this area where it's got some really nice veneer, the finish is horribly flaking off. And the veneer is coming a little bit loose. So, I, for sure, am going to refinish this at some point. I'll try to do what I can down here, but these sides, the top for sure, need to be refinished. This joint is opened up, so it's got to be clamped and repaired. So that might be hard to preserve. I mean, sure, I could do it with some, some people I've seen down in other cabinets where they're like, leave this area alone and refinish around it, but it looks, it's, it just really stands out because you're never going to get a perfect color match, so. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. I, mean, I can take reference photos and have a replica decal made. It'll cost me a few bucks, but then again, this is a pretty rare, valuable set, so. I mean, for sure this is going to be a very, very lengthy project, no matter what. Now, this side... Uh, the main body of it is pretty good, but on top, water got in here and all the plywood's come apart. And then the top is just a nightmare. This whole side's gone, but I do have all the pieces, I believe. But there's no way that this <laughs> delaminated, curled up trash veneer, or rather plywood, can be saved. Veneer, eh, I'd speculated in an earlier video, maybe these pieces could be cleaned up and glued down to a new plywood substrate. Top, I don't know, this piece isn't too bad, but this piece I think would be a little tough to completely flatten out and get all these seams tight. 
I might try to save the sides though, because I think this might be burled walnut. Oh no, I guess it's not. But it's it's pretty nice walnut veneer. This side is fine. The front isn't too bad, and I have I think all the pieces of the side. So if I got a whole new plywood top made, I'd be able to reuse some of that veneer. The top is pretty critical too. Oh, and it's a little more detailed than just being a box as well because I don't think this top sat flush. So there was a bit of a step design. So you decide, go in, come up a little bit, and then the top. It's kind of hard to say because things are so warped, but I think that's how it was. But then again, this is plywood. I don't know why you'd want to see that edge, but perhaps they put on enough finish there to obscure the plywood layers. This side's pr it's pretty tight in this back corner, so that must be how it was. There was a, a bit of an edge there. It just has enough integrity that I can flip it open. And you can see there is a mirror. So to get all the optics in this working right, it will be very important to get a box made of the proper dimension and the mirror installed in exactly the right place. The mirror is in its own little frame, so imagine this is a whole new sheet of plywood. I think this mirror could just be screwed right into it. That's critical because that's where the video output comes, so it shoots straight up out of this box, hits the mirror 45 degree angle and gets reflected towards the viewer. As I said, I took out the, some of the chassis to lighten the load, but even so, this thing is still friggin' heavy. That's where the power supply goes, and down here is where the main chassis goes. Now, I looked at the service info. It's in Riders Volume 2, and... Uh, some things I found a bit puzzling. For one, they mentioned a speaker. I think it's a 5-inch speaker. There's no speaker in this. And there's nowhere where a speaker would go. I mean, there's no mounting, there's no grill opening, nothing. Unless maybe it was mounted on the back and pointed straight back. Which seems odd. I also uh, found some uh, serial numbers, like on this box here. It's serial number 28. Or, uh, yeah, in this box. So this may be a really early unit. Although this has a number of... 1784? So I don't know. So, this box is 28, but that yoke mounting over there says... 1700 and whatever. I don't see a number on this. This box makes the high voltage. Inside here are a couple tubes and then a sealed can. They say it's a, it's oil filled and sealed and cannot be serviced. Well, inside that can is a tripler. It's got three high voltage rectifier tubes and three high voltage capacitors. So, I hope either it can be serviced without being a huge mess or that it's still good. And the tubes that it uses are numbers I don't even recognize. This is all stuff made in Holland. It says, uh... Phillips and Norelco. The name of the company is Phillips in the Netherlands, but uh, uh, because Phillips was so close to Philco, Philco complained and the court backed them up, so everything made by Phillips sold in the U.S. had to be rebranded as Norelco. So that's what that's all about. So this stuff, the optics, was a protogram system, which was used by a number of manufacturers in a number of different sets. The rest of the stuff, the receiver, the power supply, that's all uh, U.S. made. I don't know if Scott exactly designed and made it, but at least somebody made it for them. And that stuff I've still got on the back porch. Oh, so what I hope to do in this video is just clean this up a little bit. I want to very carefully clean the mirror. I want to clean that. That, that kind of scares me down there. Uh, one, that 3NP4 CRT could be tough to replace if it's bad. I don't know if it is or not. I can't test it very easily, though. I can only test the filament for continuity. My CR70 doesn't list it. And uh, amazingly, I actually had one of these a long, long time ago. Early to mid-80s. I picked it up at a ham fest, and I later sold it at another ham fest, I think for 10 bucks. 
but it was used and I have no idea if it was any good or not. But uh, that's why I recognized it immediately when I saw it. I was like, oh yeah, 25 years ago I had one of those. Uh, I just for the, I took a token look on eBay, of course, there aren't any for sale. I don't recall ever seeing one for sale. But because the system was used in a number of sets, I imagine there are some spares floating around out there. But, but anyways, what scares me about this is this opening here, it's not just a round piece of glass. That's actually a, a lens system. There are two sheets of glass with some kind of gel in between them that uh, some perform some type of focusing uh, function. So uh, I hope all that dirt will clean off and it's crystal clear and there's not some any kind of fungus or moisture that got inside there or uh, that could be uh, interesting to deal with. Here's a look at the main chassis. There's a tuner, the receiver, IF, and so on. And this is the deflection stuff. So imagine this is the vertical output transformer, horizontal output transformer. So they use a flyback, but there's actually no high voltage coming out of this. I don't, I don't even know if they left the high voltage winding in there. There's no high voltage rectifier. They're just using this to drive the horizontal deflection yoke. So the set's rather modular. All the chassis connect. These plugs so you can work on the chassis independently. Now a confusing thing about this is I've looked at the service info and riders and I just got a note from somebody who looked it up in SAMS and they both mention that there were two tuners used in this set. One made by General Instruments, one made by um, Sarks, I think it is. Tarzian Sarks, something like that. Well, they both use three tubes. So, this only has two, so it's definitely not one of those. I just carefully cleaned off a label with a toothpick. And it sure looks to me like it says Mech. Mech TT or II 10007. So that may provide some insight as to what kind of tuners in this. Uh, so <laughs> I could add another little uh, interesting twist to restoring this. That's an RCA part. Not sure what that would be. Um, horizontal os uh, oscillator transformer maybe. And this is basically an RCA design in here as you've seen in numerous of my sets. Same flyback as in the RCA 630TS and the Admiral sets. 5V4 damper tube, 6BG6 horizontal output tube, and there's a big old 50 watt power resistor. And I can tell that this is a replacement. I bet the original burned out. I say it's a replacement, it's loose and flopping around, and there's no tap like there should be. So I imagine the original one failed, and that is a replacement. That's from underneath. Well, I think this is aluminum, and that's why it's so clean inside. Or, I should say, or, or rather, I mean, that's why it's corrosion free in spite of the set being damp. Yeah, I, th I think it's a magnet. Feel some attraction, but not real strong. Okay, that's steel there. Okay, yeah. So this this is this is all aluminum. Cool. <laughs> that's what kept this so corrosion free. So this uh, this is a bit different from what I'm used to working on. That is for sure. Nice power resistors. It's crazy. Yeah, all these controls. So in addition to the front panel controls, yeah, all these controls down here. Pretty hefty too, it's like some pretty big Rio stats. So uh, yeah, as you can imagine, this this is going to be uh, interesting to work on and quite the challenge. And um, I might have a hard time getting any advice from anybody because I don't know if anybody else has one. I mean, I, for sure there are a few other of these in existence, but I don't know if any of the Collectors I know have one.
Here's the power supply chassis. Big old power transformer. I believe it's a 5 u 4 rectifier. And probably 5Y3. No, oh, 25Z6. Some electrolytics. And underneath what I imagine are chokes. So pretty straightforward. I'm working on cleaning the optical assembly right now. I just did a light cleaning of the top surface of the glass. This crud I think will come off with a little bit of scraping. Well, what I'm more concerned about is the fogginess I'm seeing. I'm hoping it's just on the other side of this assembly and it's not trapped in between two layers of glass. I notice these little screws are on the outside were rather loose and there's a little lever here or a bit of metal sticking out. I think what this is for is focusing. This is not just a piece of glass, this actually forms a, a lens assembly. So I think that's what that's about. So I need to take this off. I need to get these four screws out. Well, it came out easily enough with those four screws, but unfortunately it is foggy inside. I cleaned the back side up and it's still kind of messed up. I'll see if my camera can pick up the lens effect. I can see it when I look through it. It uh, kind of makes everything distorted and kind of weird looking. Alright, so now you can see down inside there what the fun stuff is. So there is a little 3 inch 3NP4 high voltage projection CRT. It's probably the deflection yoke, or it could be for focusing. So there's the connection end, and runs through here and projects out there. Little fingers on the side would be for the outer conductive coating, and it shoots onto that. And then shines straight back and hits this 45 degree angled mirror, so it shoots up goes through that corrective lens, hits that mirror, and then finally hits the frosted glass screen. This dusty, but looks okay. This, I really hope is good, because those eek. Oh, that's not good, it's bouncing around in there. I think it's just card stock though, so wouldn't have scratched anything up. I'll have to figure out where it went. Probably around the CRT in some manner. I notice this is a little loose. It might have been a shim for down in there. I'm hoping I can find some diagrams that show how all this stuff goes together. My concern is that the rider service info or the, or the SAMs might just talk about this. And not this, because this is all from Protogram or you know, Philips slash Norelco. And they, this isn't supposed to be serviced, I don't believe, <laughs> by a normal service tech. You just send it back to Norelco for a replacement or for servicing. Uh, but perhaps I can find some service info just directly on these two components, you know, if I need it. I carefully removed the two little screws that were holding on this channel plate, and here's what I found underneath. Channels 1 through 13 in a different configuration than on this. Now, I know from the service info this set came with several different tuners, so I figure either this was the earliest type of tuner that was used, or perhaps this even predates the electronics they may have designed this cabinet and had them made before they even finalized the tuner design 
because every version I've seen of this set has its plate on it. Now, speaking of the tuner, I did find uh, some mention of the Mech TT10007 tuner in some service info for Mech sets from the 40s, so no doubt that's what this is. And I also saw somebody mention that Mech bought out Scott Laboratories in 1950, so this actually may be a very late version of this set after Mech bought them out. I don't know, I figure it's either going to be really early, really late, or this was modified after the set was made. Uh, obviously the, the tuner fits in here perfectly, so I'm inclined to think this was original to the set. Started doing a little bit of cleaning. It's really a, it's just really uh, uh, dirty. I just used a, uh, a damp rag and uh, it's coming clean quite nicely. I don't know if I want to go as far as polishing it up, but... For sure, because this being aluminum, I could take some semichrome and I could make this really gleam, although there are a lot of scratches on it. But for now, I'm just going to get the worst of the dust and the grime off of it. Now, as for the cabinet, as I've been fooling around with it, the front piece just broke off completely. But that gave me a chance to examine the construction more closely. And I'm thinking, I could handle this. All it is is a big square piece of 3 8 inch plywood, three sides of 3 8 inch plywood, and then the back, which I, which I think is 3 quarters. And this might actually be solid wood rather than plywood. Only issue I've seen so far is that I will need to get some type of tool that can cut out, um, I guess I call this a rabbit or a dado which runs the length of the sides so the top is just a big square piece and then the sides all have this routed out and then the corners are cut at a 45 degree angle and there's like some kind of biscuit or something so this just it goes on like so. It's basically just a big box and then it's painted black on the inside and the mirror is screwed down with this frame which I can probably reuse so I was looking around briefly for mini table saws capable of doing this work. I saw some that are commercial grade that are like 400 bucks. I don't want to spend that kind of money. And I may even be able to lease one. I'm not sure. It might be worth looking into. Or if I can find somebody local who's got, um, a, you know, would be willing to do it for me or let me borrow it. I don't really want to, you know, invest a ton of money. I've also seen some really cheap ones that are like 100 bucks or less, but I don't know if they'd be up to the challenge of doing this. I don't really have any other projects that I really need a table saw for right now, but I do kind of want to do something soon just to stabilize this thing because it's kind of falling apart. Now, on to other matters. I found a great restoration thread about this set on the Antique Radio Forum. It turns out that these perhaps aren't quite as rare as I thought. I mean, they're scarce, no doubt. But somebody chimed in that he had just gotten one, and several other members chimed in that they had one or more of them, and then there were a bunch of great pictures posted. So obviously there's other ones floating around out there, which is good because I got some great reference photos, and I know I can get advice from these guys. So first off, I know where the speaker goes. There's two holes here. There should be a couple right angle brackets, and the speaker goes right here. It's just like a four inch permanent magnet, eight ohm speaker, nothing fancy. So it'll be easy to replace. What's not so good is what I read about the optics. For sure this should be clear. And uh, I've already screwed back down. Uh, the other bad thing is these reflective surfaces uh, should be pristine and you should not touch these. Well these are already pretty well trashed. So I tried cleaning them and I got it better but you can see there's an awful lot of marring on here. These are not easy or inexpensive to replace because these are not your typical mirrors. A typical mirror is a sheet of glass that's silver plated on the back side. So you're looking through the glass to the reflective surface. That's no good for projection sets because if you were to use a mirror like that you're gonna get a double image. Some of the light will reflect off the surface of the glass and some off the back of the mirror. 
these are like laboratory grade high quality optical type mirrors where they're service they're silver plated on the top of the glass so there's no refraction there's no double reflection so this is just pure silver we're looking at here and then there's a sheet of glass underneath it so what's happened I imagine from the damp environment people touching it maybe trying to clean it I don't know it's got some white splotches and then it's got all kinds of spots and streaks and you know all over it this would probably be the easier of the one to deal with the ones down in here not so much although I do know I've seen other guys restore uh, projection sets the larger variety like with the five inch projection CRT and a, a larger screen and I've seen guys get the mirrors inside here like the, the round one with the hole in the middle to get that one replated so it can be done but I'm guessing it's going to cost a few hundred bucks if I wanted to get all this stuff done if I can even find somebody capable of doing it so for now I will just leave all these as is until I get the set working assuming I can get the set working and then we'll see what the image looks like and then I'll worry about it this might be the most difficult of all uh, I, probably the only place I could ever hope to find a replacement is from another one of these protogram units. Perhaps it's still a little unclear how this set is actually used, so I just reinstalled the viewing screen which I had removed for safekeeping. It's a piece of frosted glass. So normally when the set isn't being used, this top would be down. And it just looks like a giant box. It's hung up on something. Right, so it would just be like this normally. When you want to watch it, you'd flip this top up, and it would be at like a 45 degree angle. So the light coming from below, it shoots straight up and hits that mirror. And there's a little, well there would be a little arm on the right side to prop it up at the proper angle, which is broken off. So I'm just going to lay this down. And this part flips up, this, like, so, at like a right angle. So that's what you view. And there are cardboard panels on the side that open up to block out incidental light from getting in. So this is what you would watch. So this is all obviously, you know, <laughs> messed up and damaged and falling apart so I gotta be very careful with it now let's take a look inside this box as I mentioned earlier this generates the high voltage for the CRT about 25,000 volts and uh, there's a tripler inside here that's supposed to be sealed but there are also two user serviceable tubes 6 BG6 output tube and another tube used for the oscillator. So let's take a look. Right, so, well, there's the sealed can. Uh, trying to figure out how exactly it's sealed. So there are, it looks like there's a strap on either side that goes down around the bottom somehow. Might be screws on the bottom you can undo. Hold on. No, I don't feel anything along the, around the bottom. Oh, I see there are screws on the side. Because I'm thinking uh, there got to be some resistors and capacitors down in there for that oscillator to be running, so I should take a look down inside there at some point. Uh, I'm not going to open up this though until I know that it actually has a problem. That's kind of interesting. This is actually a shielded cable. Looks like there's a collar around the outside. A little brass collar that's got a screw and then a wire solder going to this can. And there's a label. Uh, not much to see unfortunately. I've been hoping to find a serial number on this thing or some information, a date, anything. All I see is high V pack. I assume it's for high voltage and it's faint, but it says V 3909 C 41454 V5 
and then somebody's initials. And that is it. Might have been the inspector or something like that. It was just hanging here like so. A uh, further guy said that there's a tag on the back of the set with a serial number, but mine has nothing on it whatsoever. I just consulted the service info to find the pinout for this 3NP4 so I can test for filament continuity. Cannot test this in any picture tube tester that I have, or I don't think any period. I think you have to hook it up to 25,000 volts. Five pins on the base. Two are ground, one is filament, and the other two are grids. So I assume the ground must be the other side of the filament. Before I check that, I just remembered I actually have a 5-inch projection CRT. I got this along with a few sets uh, earlier this year. The uh, Motorola VK106 and Admiral 17T1 and 16-inch uh, uh, Filco. And uh, while I was there, the guy had a room full of tubes, and I grabbed a bunch of globe tubes, and my friend noticed this sitting on the shelf and said, hey, that looks like something you might like, and yes, indeed. So I took it. This is for a Filco projection set. I think it's a TP400A. Uh, yeah, there it is, TP400A. So basically it does exactly the same thing as this guy, only it's larger, and the projection screen that this would shine onto was a bit bigger than this little 3-inch set can do. Very similar uh, concept, though. So these must have extra thick aluminized coatings and phosphor to be able to withstand that high of voltage. And uh, as far as I know, these have a, a decent enough life. I've heard guys say even if you find one that's all brown looking, because over time these do turn brown, like you get a brown rectangle on there, they still work just fine. So I really don't know what the operational life is of these, but I don't see any phosphor burns or ion burns or anything on that. And uh, likewise, this one looks pristine. Alright, now the fateful moment. Is this filament any good? Let's see. All right, yeah, that looks very promising. Cool. So I'll keep my fingers crossed, because uh, I already put out some feelers for a replacement, you know, just in case this one's bad, or just to have a spare, and uh, uh, no, uh, no leads so far. So definitely want to take very extra TLC on this picture, too. I did a little looking around to find a source of 3 8 inch birch plywood, and it turns out it's readily available online if I want to order it, but unfortunately my local hardware stores and home improvement centers only have quarter inch and half inch, so that's kind of annoying, but uh, I'm sure I'll pick some up somewhere. And finally, to give you some idea of the scale of this picture, here's a 7 inch picture tube from one of those little Motorola sets that I've got a bunch of and you can see how much larger this screen is than that little screen. They're both on the market at the same time but considerable price difference and off there in the distance is a 21 inch Predicta CRT so this is about on par with a 21 inch. I guess Technically, I think it's 23 inches. But keep in mind that Predicta came out a decade after this came out. Alright, that's going to be it for now. I'll continue cleaning and tinkering. And if you've got any suggestions on repairing the cabinet or the optics, please leave a comment. Hope you enjoyed this look at a Scott 6T11 tabletop projection set from around 1948.